Well, hello there. If you recognize that song, I'm sure you do. It was the song we did our very first uh, YouTube stream to, and I'm going to stop it right now. That was Shane Faison. I bought the tape on eBay. Matter of fact, it's... Let me get it over here. It's this tape right here. It was recorded in Burbank, California at a, at a place called The Enterprise, which is no longer there. It was bought by another company called the, uh, Paramount Recording Group, which used to be Paramount Recording, which was the studio I got my first job in back in 1987, <clears throat> six in L.A. when I moved out there at a ripe old 20 some years old. Five, six. I wanted to do another one of these. I want to do these more often. I want to try and get one every week. We, this one's not live. I am taping this so I can just put it up on the YouTube channel. I will do more live ones. But I wanted to take this one right now basically to, to roll back what my first one was about. was like 12 steps ahead of where we want to go. Or where we want to get to. That's where we want to get to. But we got to start somewhere. And I'm going to get a lavalier mic. So this stupid microphone's not in my way. And you can see me. And I'm also going to work on getting the cameras in a little better shape. As you can see right now, it's a split screen. So you can see our, our nice big tape deck. But you can't see the one that I have right over here. And so I want to be able to show you a lot of things. but Which is fine. Because for what we're doing here. Ultimately, it's going to end up being using the ATR-80 is what it's called over there. So, analog tape. Um, when I started building this studio, I actually didn't even dawn on me that um, I was going to have a problem selling the studio because most musicians under the age of 40 doesn't even know what analog is. Nah, I'm, not, I'm, being, I'm, I'm not being fair. Under the age of 30, 31-year-old um, born around 87 they they can remember cassettes they can um it was towards the end they would be the last generation like my oldest son my partner in this austin who has a lot of radio shows talk shows on the ap radio side of the uh of the business here he uh he has no clue about tape and that's what he's learning that's what i'm showing him he knows all about the daw digital audio workstation he is really getting very adept at that I I'm getting I can get my way around it. I was actually in the studio when Pro Tools one and the Macintosh two was installed. I remember the first direct to disc and the ADAT and the Akai S nine hundred sampler. Oh gosh, yeah. I knew that was a bad trend. I just did. And for me, that's strictly me. Um the studio is built the way I believe music should be made. Me music should be made analogally, if that's even a word. Analog tape so let's start there we have in commercial in commercial applications we have three kinds of tape three si well four sizes but we're working with three here this is quarter inch as you can see quarter inch tape small right over my shoulder this shoulder right there you can barely see it i'll get out of the way Right next to the big, tall air conditioner, there's a two-track machine. And that's what that song you heard on the intro, that's what I recorded the mix down to, was to a two-track. Back in the day, that was our final. We would give the artist one of these, and then they would take this to the mastering facility, and from there they would make the cassettes or... Um, eventually the CDs and things like that. Uh, lower non-labeled artist acts we gave just really good quality cassettes. But yeah, if you can, let me get out of the way here. Uh, you can see it. It's that right there. That's the two track. That's where we put our final mix. And then I can't show you because I'm not going to move the cameras, but the next size up we deploy 
and which will be our bread and butter just really from a cost analysis or a cost perspective is half inch tape as you can see it's twice as big as the quarter you know 2500 feet around this this is half inch tape and we use this on a 16 track multi-track machine meaning that we can put 16 individual tracks on one tape to give us 16 track half inch and that's going to be most of our our bread and butter and like i said you really can't see it here and i'm not going to try to move it uh the camera it, it'll be it won't look good so i'll get it on another shot and it's also you'll see it from the side and what we're doing with the shane phase on um project is two inch 2500 feet as well two inch tape there is a third um, format one inch I have no experience with one inch on retrospect because of the cost I uh, I only when I built this did did it by what I could remember and what I worked on I worked on the 16 track half inch and they we didn't have these cool plastic things back in my day and <clears throat> that's what I did a lot of my work on and then the two track I mean the 24 track two inch <coughs> pardon me and then the quarter inch mixed down but in hindsight I should have got a one inch 16 or a one inch 24 uh, that tape is about a third or a half of what today this is a hundred bucks new today this is 400 new because it's supply and demand there are two manufacturers for tape one in the states and one in france it is the same tape it is made by a company called atr and they used to be uh quandry which is the name of this one right here i think it's called quandry yeah uh 456 yeah quan quantity and then before that it was ampex and that was the tape we used back in the 80s ampex 456 it was the industry standard there's another company called rtm uh return to the masters or Chords to the masters i can't remember and that is basically the the formula for basf which was a very other popular tape of the day but ampex was the better tape sorry i am parched a little we've uh spent all day and last late last night automating the radio side so we can start offering 24 7 programming uh which is exciting so i'm just uh, i'm a little tired and a little uh, um tired so to begin with with analog with our formats signal flow is like water if you think of it that way and you can see a little bit of my board you can see a little bit right here all right here's channel one and you can't really see a lot of it um i'm gonna move some i want to move the camera a little bit so you can see this so hold on okay i'm a little in it here but here it is this is the input to channel one and then we start with the very top where we have our gain, either be at a line level or a mic level. And that's with all the connections that you can see, all the wires on the camera that has the tape deck in it. You see all the wires on the back of the board. So we start with the, the gain. And inside the gain, we have the ability to, uh, to, to add more, vo to bring volume into the channel. And then from that, after that, we have our equalization where we can we want to we want to affect as little to tape as possible um because when you when you eq to tape you also eq the noise so if you put too much high in and you're just in, in you're just bringing out the hiss which is good for tape which is missing in today's music but you do want to eq because that's what this orange section is these two are frequencies and then these and then these four are volume that's why they're color coded Here's effect sense. That's how you get um, signal from the board to our patch panel over here. 
which I, again, I can't really show you, to our effects rack, which I will also try to get another uh, later on when we start using it. So you can compress really strong signal and balance it out. And then we will be talking about out for outboard gear and what they all do. And you, that's where you could add reverb. That's where you could echo. You could add all these different effects. You go through here. Now, my council, our council here is a little different. We have 24 of these across the top. Well, we also have another 24 right down here for the, uh, the potential of 48 inputs. It's a, it's a stackable board. This was made in the 90s, and this is something that they started doing. Back when I worked on consoles, this would have been a 48-channel board, and it would have been as long as this desk. Um, I'm not a fan of it. I like it because it gives us a lot of uh, expandability, but I don't like the stacking. But here's two. It's just a top and a low of microphones, a pan, and then also another gain. And then these are pans for um, mixing. You don't put everything straight at 12 o'clock. You put one thing there, generally the vocal, and then you build around it. And if you ever listen to a song, especially drums, and you hear a tom roll, the, you know, the little small drums that are usually up on, they're on racks, and they're usually above the snare and on, sits on top of the, the bass drum. When they roll, they roll left or right, and that's because we pan them to give you that stereo imagery. And then from here, we have our fader. So this is also tweaks the volume and gives us a little bit of control. This is where you make your nuances. And if you remember the first video, this is the first thing I, you saw me mess with this the most was when I was doing the mix down. So you learn this right here. And you get the grasp of the sound wave, which is analog, goes from that microphone, from that guitar, into a wire, into a snake, down a wire, into this board, into this channel, out of this channel, to tape. Water, a river. You learn this really well, and you multiply it by 25, 24 times, or however many your board is, boom. You learn signal flow. And it's the number one thing that people aren't teaching in school these days. They're not teaching signal flow. They're teaching computer gaming because that's what digital mixing is all about. It's just plug this, plug this in, plug this in, plug ins. Oh, your guitar is a little, tone's a little off. I'll put a plug in. Oh, your voice is a little off. I'll put a plug in. I'll auto tune it. Oh, this, that, that. And if you don't know signal flow, you don't know jack about engineering. That's just my, my rule, my belief. You don't have a thing about engineering so with that being said you learn the signal flow you learn what it does you learn where it goes because it comes from that microphone down the snake into this board and then it, it's affected all through this board and then it just circles itself right back out of the board into the patch panel out of the patch panel then into that deck that's in front of me onto that channel so Channel one on Sean's or Shane's reel with Heartbroken. Track one is the bass. Track two is a keyboard. Track three is another keyboard. We have nothing on track four. Track five is a piano. Six is free. We have male vocal one on seven, male vocal two on eight. And then we go kick, snare, hi-hat. We're open on 12. Then we have a percussion track because even though this is on analog tape, this was 1998 and everybody was gung-ho on the digital and this was a drum machine and this was a sequencing keyboard. The only thing I believe that was analog on here besides the vocals was maybe, maybe the bass drum, bass guitar, maybe. I'd have to solo that and double check, which we will talk about. You heard me do it last week or two weeks ago when I soloed the female singer's voice when I was trying to gate some noise out. And then we'll also talk about that. And then... Uh, Tracks 14 through 18 are empty, and then we have 19 and 20, the female vocal. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 19 female, uh, 19 female vocal, 20 was another keyboard, kind of like a horn thing. And then 21, 2 is uh, the other female. 
now the problem and i don't i haven't posted the song and i need to i need to figure out a way to post the song because i want people to hear it and i want people to critique it and then let me know what they're hearing and i'll let you in on a little secret 20 track 21 uh the uh the it's that me 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 well if you listen really 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 close there's a 10k little squeal through the whole song it's on the track and i hear it horribly because i know it's there but then again i also can hear their headphones um of the other vocals and i also do believe i'm missing a vocal on this because there's a first verse but then there's just scatting on the second verse then it goes first verse chorus scatting chorus then the female verse and so i think i need to add, i gotta revisit so we're not done with um with shane's song we're gonna sit with it we're gonna we're gonna work with it together as um i don't know maybe for the next four or six weeks we'll see so bye i want to wrap this one up because like i said this is just the basics for analog your analog is all about the signal flow it's where that so that signal goes once it enters the wire that is the most that is the the basis of signal flow where does it go how does it get to the machines how do we affect it how do we manipulate it and one thing we always have to worry about with analog is our noise floor there's no such thing of a, as a noise floor in digital it's crystal clear it's almost too perfect that's why it doesn't sound right we need that warmth uh that 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 well the hiss the noise that's what makes the song alive that's what makes it breathe so we have to be very careful what we do when we when we affect or e equalize the signal to tape we want it as clean as possible now they do have noise reduction built in you can turn it on on this tape let me let me you won't really see it really well but Uh, you can't really see it because you see it's right here. There is built-in noise reduction on that, on that, in that. It's DBX, and it was so funny. Austin asked me what DBX was because it's unheard of now. You know, what's DBX? It's like noise reduction. What's that? <laughs> and really all it does, if you hear it now, all it does, and we'll, we'll probably, I'll, show, I'll give you a demonstration in, da in future uh, shows. All it does is it really makes it muddy. It, it's yes, it's suppressing the hiss, but it makes it muddy. Um, I don't remember that back then, because it was just the standard. We wanted it, because we were trying to make the tracks clean. Well, now they're too clean, so now we want to make them a little dirty. So, which is kind of funny. So that uh, what we're using here, this board is a EuroDesk, by made by Behringer, and MX9000 is the model. Our 24-track machine is a Tascam ATR80. Our 16-track machine is a Tascam MSR16. Our two-track uh, machine is a TX3300, also a Tascam brand. I'm a big fan of Tascam. They were, they didn't get their due, but you know what? They're still around. They're still making things. So you know what? They had the last laugh where play things like Atari, Studer, Neve, well, Neve's still around. MCI, all these other uh, decks, all these other are supposedly m pro, um, they've faded away. Tascam's still alive and kicking. So that ATR80 deck, that 24 track, and that in the in the other camera, they uh, that deck has made. I think it made the Toto Africa album, if I remember correctly. That deck is, and they only made that deck for three years. It's actually the wrong deck I should have bought because I'm going to have a bitch of a time finding parts, but it is what it is. So I want to wrap this one up. We, uh, uh, we have about, I want to, I want to go a half hour. So I got 10 more minutes. I do want to let everybody know, please email me. The email is on the screen. You could also call, but I do have uh, my IT business I run during the week. So that's the, the number on the screen is also for the studio. And there is an uh, answer machine here, and I'll get it back. But if you want to get a hold of me, 
Email me. Email me your questions. Email me what you want to do. Email me what you want to learn. I have no problem um, sharing this knowledge. You're not going to learn it at SAE. You're not going to learn it at the recording workshop or full sale. They've passed that. You know, I, I read a lot of uh, music engineering forums now and groups on, you know, on social media, Facebook or whatever. And I just recently had to go look up what the hell a stem was because that's all they talk about. I don't know what a stem is. How long do you keep stems? I'm a stem is a digital version of the tracks, basically, you know, um, see what you can do with this board. Okay, that's better. You won't see me, but you get I, I don't need you to see me. Okay, what you can do is you have if you had a stem, a digital an analog version of a stem. We have our drums, kick, snare, we and for nomenclature here, gang, K S kick snare, rack one, rack two means tom one, tom two, floor, and then overhead. Overhead one, overhead two, overhead left, overhead right. So kick, snare, rack one, rack two, floor, overhead one, overhead two, left and right. We have these mixed. We mix these all down. Now, what you do on a digitally is inside your DAW, you turn that all into a stem and you mix it all down and it's one component. So then you label that drums. So basically it's already affected. It's already, uh, it's already been EQ'd. It's already been, it's everything. It's all done. And then you just, yeah, then all you're doing is basically putting parts together, which to me is still not engineering. But what we can do here is we can put this all right here. And this is what's called subgrouping. And then I can mix all this down, get all my effects in here and do everything. And then I could bring up just those two. And because this is my subgroup, I have eight subgroups. So I could subgroup my drums. And if you want, hear that? That is analog, my friends. If you hear that, I don't know how well the microphone will pick it up. That's ground buzz. Yeah. That's the noise floor because I, I turn it up so high so you can hear that. We bury things inside that floor. But yes, I can make an analog version of a stem here and run it to a subgroup. Now, the difference between a DAW and what we do is you take that stem, you mix those drums, and you save it, and you're done with it. You're basically turning a song into pieces. And then when you're done, you throw your stems in and you build your song around and you probably can adjust and play with them a little bit. But for the most part, um, it's done in pieces and that's why some songs feel that way and sound that way. They don't blend well. Well, here, as you saw when I was mixing the, the Shane Faison song, Heartbroken, a couple weeks ago, I'm doing it live all the way even down to fading it out. I'm doing it all live. So... There's a part where she really has a heck of a voice. I'd love to know who she is. She has a heck of a voice. She's got a good two, three, two, three octave, maybe four octave. And she does a scat. And it's, you know, I, I compress it a little bit, but I still got to ride my fader. And that is done live. That's part of, that is part of the artistry of being an engineer. That's part of the talent. And that is part of, of, of the art form that is engineering. Not just clicking buttons, not just clicking a, and, and scrolling around with a mouse. There is an art form to this. And digital just doesn't get it. Yeah, there's some great songs out there. I mean, Hailstorm's one of my favorite bands. And they record all digitally, but they also record in studios like, you can't, I, uh, yeah, you can see it. You can see it on the back of my uh, tape deck. They record in, Lizzie was posting pictures, Lizzie Hale, for those that don't know Hailstorm, is the lead singer female lead singer of a five-piece rock band called Hailstorm. They've been around for about 10 years. 
uh, seen them a bazillion times and watched them at little small venues, and now they're playing big amphitheaters. I'm so proud of them. I'm very happy for them. But if you look behind, if you look at the wall um, on the left of the tape deck and you look behind it, that is all acoustical, uh, acoustic foam. It's sound deadening. We deadened the room. So there's no slap. It's called a slap back echo. That's basically reverb. You walk into an empty bedroom in your house or your apartment when you move in and you talk and you have that little really fast, tight reverberation. Well, that's just the room. Well, we don't want that here. We want we have our monitors on either side of a giant TV and I'm going to get another set. I want more. Well, actually, I have two in the ceiling and I really am going to just turn them on. Because that will be a second set of reference monitors because they're just Yamahas and, and you want different sets of monitors for different um, flavors that the, that the speaker will do. And we'll talk about speakers. We, I've got a whole lessons plan that I want to talk about and everything. Uh, but we, um, you have to treat your room. You have to treat everything. Even in digitally, like I said, with the hailstorm, they're doing it digitally, but she was still in a, in, a, in a vocal booth, in a vocal room. And then I've seen other bands or other artists. I saw Dia Frampton was working on an album, and she's just in some guy's living room. He's got a guitar, he's got a Mac keyboard, and he's got a controller in front of him. I, and, you know, you see a little mixer, but there's no treatment, and that's going to affect the sound. But, you know, it, you, anybody can, I, you're, we're, in, we're in a converted bedroom in my house. You know, I'd love to put this in a warehouse. I'd love to get this to the point where I can get it out of, or gut this house and turn it into a real studio. Rip these eight foot ceilings and go all the way up. I'd do it in a heartbeat. Um, and that's my ultimate goal. My ultimate goal is to get this into a functioning production facility. But uh, you have to treat the room. And so many people, I saw a band, Waylon, they were cutting vocals in what looks like someone's dining slash kitchen. And, you know, anybody with a with an interface, which is just a digital piece of gear that allows you to connect to a computer. Anybody has one of those on a, in a bedroom. Anybody has a keyboard that's a MIDI controller or that little well, you can't see it in this shot. Or we have we have actually have a MIDI controller. You can make music anywhere, but making it sound like you want to hear it on the radio is where the art comes in and making it analog tape is definitely where the art comes in so with that being said i want to thank everyone for tuning in i hope you got something out of this please email me questions we'll talk more about tape later on this was just basically an introduction about the basics of signal flow we're going to uh, do this i'm going to try to get a couple of these a week out but i'm definitely going to do one a week and as we expand and do more, we, they will be longer. This one's only 30 minutes because I just wanted to talk about the machines and signal flow in this one. So with that being said, um, tune into APRadio.net. Listen to all of our programs. We do a lot of talk shows and we do a lot of uh, music. Um, it is a rock station, but I will bust out some top 40 retro. I will bust out some R&B. I will bust out some disco. Um, I will bust out some blues and jazz. I, I don't care. I'll, I'll play. There, I've got a whole bunch of rap I can play. I love s some rap songs out there. I love music. If it's a good song, it's a good song. And it's universal and it crosses over. So uh, email me your questions. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you, what you want to do. Uh, let me know what you want to learn. And we'll, uh, we'll talk. In, and then I will talk later on in the week. Yeah, we'll talk uh, later on in the week. I'm going to try to get these up every Sunday. If I do more than one, um, you'll get a bonus if I can do more than one. But right now, we've got this one done. This is the basics about our signal flow. And again, my name is Paul Walters. I am the owner and the operator and the driving force behind AP Radio and recording with my son, Austin. I will talk to you all real soon. Any questions, please email me. The number and the phone are on the screen. We will talk to you really soon. Have a good night.